Wow, this is a, a great assembly here. I haven't seen this many people in the reception room yet, so this is fabulous. So today, uh, we want to focus on one of the issues that I want to raise with the legislature, which is the uh, indexing of the tobacco tax. The tobacco tax was something that we raised in 2013 uh, for two reasons. One, because we were looking at a $623 million deficit projected for the next biennium, and also because we wanted to discourage all Minnesotans, but especially young Minnesotans, from beginning to smoke, or from, uh, if they are, were smoking, to quit smoking. And as uh, Commissioner Ellinger and others can uh, attest, uh, that's been a very successful strategy. So, uh, and, and the re tax revenue for, from tobacco is significant, let's say $1.3 billion in the 14-15 biennium. So there, and, and, and to index it now, uh, freeze, freeze the rate, over the next decade would cost uh, Minnesota revenues over $300 million. So there are good policy reasons and there are important tax and fiscal stability reasons to uh, have the tax rise with inflation. It's, it's indexed for inflation. There are a number of other tax features in Minnesota, starting with the income tax brackets that are indexed for inflation. So this is not nothing unusual. And if you don't index for inflation, then the effective tax rate diminishes uh, over time. So uh, I think that uh, the health of all these young people and others in the back there and everyone else uh, in Minnesota is a lot more important than, than uh, appeasing big tobacco. And that's what was the motivating force in, in, in this provision. So it's uh, one that definitely should, should be removed. And those who uh, continue to advocate for it should be really challenged as to what public purpose they think it serves. With that, let me turn it over to um, Molly Moynihan Moyn and say that. I know your family, I know your, well, John and Bonnie, they were your great, great aunt and uncle. That's Moynihan. great. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Molly Moylanen, Director of Public Affairs at Clearway, Minnesota, a statewide nonprofit working to reduce tobacco's harm in Minnesota. Clearway also co-chairs Minnesotans for a Smoke-Free Generation. We're a growing coalition of over 50 organizations who want to end youth smoking for good in our state. Other members of our coalition include fellow co-chair organization Blue Cross, the Mayo Clinic, the local chapters of the American Cancer Society and Heart and Lung Associations, and many, many more. On behalf of the coalition, I am proud to enthusiastically thank Governor Dayton and his administration, including Commissioner Ellinger, Commissioner Bowerly, for their steadfast support in recognizing the importance of keeping tobacco prices high. Governor, for years, you have been a superstar when it comes to smoking youth prevention. Not only did you sign into law a significant tax, significant price increase in 2013, you consistently show leadership on this issue educating the public and your fellow elected officials about why preventing smoking must be a priority for Minnesota. By pointing out the tobacco tax cuts in the tax bill and reminding us all how those tax cuts help tobacco companies, you are helping to create a healthier future for our whole state and you are helping to remind us that big tobacco can hurt our kids, so thank you. Tobacco tax increases work hand in hand with available cessation services to cut smoking rates. As the governor has noted many times, the tax he put into place in 2013 has prevented smoking and motivated quitting across Minnesota. Youth smoking has fallen. The state health department found it's dropped by a third among 11th graders since the tax increase. Now we have a lot of kids in the room today, right? Some of them were even here when Governor Dayton signed the original tax bill back in 2013. They're a little taller now, but as they grow up, they're a living illustration of what a smoke-free generation means. It means kids who will never see smoking in a restaurant. It means kids who don't have easy access to tobacco products like we had in generations past. And it means kids who decades from now won't be looking back and thinking, why? Why did I ever start smoking? They won't need to 
because they won't ever start. Protecting them from tobacco is a universal concern. It isn't a partisan issue. The Freedom to Breathe Act, 10 years ago, was passed with bipartisan support and signed by a Republican governor, Governor Pawlenty. That same governor also increased cigarette prices himself. It's always made sense, and it still makes sense now, for elected officials to come together on this issue, regardless of politics. That's why I'll close today with a call to action to leaders of both parties. Come back and remove these tax breaks, which benefit an industry that causes death and disease and drives up health care costs for all of us. Tobacco use, use tobacco prices and cessation services as options, as tools to reduce smoking. It's common sense. Again, thank you, Governor. You have done the right thing, and we really hope many others will join you here soon. Megan. Good morning. My name is Megan McFarling. I live in Shoreview, and I just finished my junior year at Mounds U High School. Last year, I testified and helped pass our flavored tobacco restrictions in Shoreview. The majority of my friends are 15, 16, and 17 years old. I would guess about half of them use tobacco products. They are not difficult to get if you know who to buy them from. And you might be surprised to learn that most of them are using cigars. This year, the legislator decided to make cigars cheaper. Well, I've seen from other kids how smokers start with the cheap products because you can afford them. That's the one way that tobacco companies can really get to you. Another way is by brainwashing you into believing that smoking is cool and that will, it will make you feel good. Kids think cigars are harmless compared to cigarettes. They don't realize what addiction is, and um, the more they do it, the harder it is to stop. One puff leads to another, and it all adds up to a lifelong addiction, which means a short life. I want to thank Governor Dayton um, for helping pr to protect our teens and future generations to come from these dangerous and deadly products. It's not too late to reject these tax cuts and to make the health of Minnesota a priority. I hope Minnesota lawmakers are listening and will join us. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Trey L. Godfrey, and I live in St. Paul. I'm a graduate of the Living Life Changes Possible group, and I've been working to prevent youth tobacco use since I was 11 years old. The tobacco industry is still determined to find new ways to appeal to youth. One way is to get them interested in smoking is with products that kids don't know are as dangerous, like cigars. Well, cigars are just as bad and just as dangerous as cigarettes. Cigarettes. Anything that kids can get to try, or anything they can get kids to try smoking is bad. But there is one thing you may have may not have noticed about cigars. They appeal to a lot to young men like me, that, well, at least they look like me. The guy, they make guys feel important, like they're rich and powerful. And once you try it, you're hooked. At the Capitol, when they agreed to cut the price on cigars. I didn't know what they were thinking. I don't know how they thought they could get away with it. Maybe they thought it would, be, it would only be noticed by rich people, but by attracting them to smoking, it's going to hurt a lot of people who aren't rich. That's for sure. So I'm glad the governor has noticed and is trying to, take, or is trying to make other people notice. Thank you, governor. I hope they listen to you. My name is Ann Deschler, and I'm an Edina resident, and I'm also a volunteer for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. But I'm here today as a granddaughter and an oncology nurse to share what I've learned the hard way in life and to support protecting our state's tobacco tax. When I was just 16, I watched my grandmother die in six months of a cancer we now know is associated with secondhand smoke. Losing her so quickly and at a relatively young age inspired me to pursue a career in cancer research and nursing. 
Later, just out of nursing school, I heard a whistleblower from the tobacco company speak at the American Cancer Society. I was shocked to learn how these companies had worked to suppress data about the dangers of their products and how they intentionally developed the products to be addictive. As an oncology nurse, I have seen the toll cancer takes on families, doctors' visits, treatments, side effects, finances, and fear. Cancer is agonizing for families, especially when it could have been prevented, as in the case of tobacco-related cancers, and when it results in the death of a loved one. I have learned many lessons through these experiences, and I want to share an important one with you today. The tobacco industry cares more about its profits than it does about the health of Minnesotans. Smoking is responsible for the deaths of more than 6,000 Minnesotans every year. 40% of those deaths are from cancer tied directly to smoking. Our state did the right thing by raising tobacco tax in 2013. Increasing tobacco taxes is one of the most effective ways to prevent kids from starting and to encourage adults to quit. The tobacco tax increase of 2013 is working. Smoking rates are at their lowest levels ever, which means fewer people will face a cancer diagnosis. I want to also thank Governor Dayton for calling the legislature's, legislature's tobacco tax breaks out for what they are, in his words, galling and indefensible. Governor Dayton is working to protect Minnesota kids from a potential lifetime of tobacco addiction and from the cancer diagnosis that can come with it. As a health professional, a mom, advocate, and in honor of my grandmother, I ask the legislature to reconsider its position. Our lawmakers should be putting the health of Minnesotans ahead of the tobacco industry profits and keep the price of tobacco high. Commissioner? Good morning, I'm Ed Ellinger, Commissioner of Health, and it's truly a pleasure to be up here with uh, Governor Dayton, who's been taking great leads in the tobacco control effort with my colleagues from the tobacco control community, and certainly for all of the, with, among all of these children who really are the beneficiaries of good public policy. And as you've heard, we've made great progress in recent decades when it comes to reducing the health impacts of tobacco, yet tobacco remains still the number one public health problem in our country. We've made a lot of progress, but there's still a long way to go. More than 6,300 Minnesota <clears throat> adults die each year from smoking-related illnesses, and smoking costs Minnesota more than $3 billion each year in excess health care costs. That amounts to $593 per person per year. The tobacco tax addresses this by raising the price of tobacco to a level that discourages children from starting to smoke and gives adult smokers extra incentive to quit. Decades of research have shown that the positive impact of tobacco taxes have on reducing tobacco use. Our latest evidence comes from a recent study done by staff at the Minnesota Department of Health and Clearway, Minnesota researchers. The study reinforces the powerful impact that the Minnesota tax increase has had after it was implemented in 2013. The researchers found that about half of all smokers felt motivated to take steps towards quitting as a result of the increased taxes. The tax increase also had a positive impact on youth cigar smoking. The year after the tobacco was uh, enacted, we saw the first decrease in youth cigar smoking rates since those data were first started to be collected in year 2000. Given the disproportionate impact of tobacco on low-income populations and populations of color and American Indians, tobacco taxes also help us with our advancing health equity reports where we want every Minnesota to have the opportunity to be healthy. Knowing how, tobacco, how, the, how effective the tobacco tax is for protecting people from disease and death, not to mention sparing us from unnecessary millions of dollars in health care costs, it is really hard to understand why anyone would want to weaken this powerful public health tool. We need to keep the tobacco tax inflator in place to ensure that it retains the ability to motivate people to quit, and we need to keep the premium cigar tax intact. The inflator is especially important because it helps keep taxes on pace with inflation and prevents their positive health impact from declining over the years. Without that annual adjustment, the likelihood of, that we, of our success in reducing tobacco use really starts to wane. 
Tobacco taxes in combination with strong cessation infrastructure and prevention efforts are essential to our goal of achieving a smoke-free generation. So I thank Governor Dayton for drawing attention to this important public health issue, to all of the advocates who have been working tirelessly on this, and I ask state legislators to help us by reconsidering the tobacco tax decision from this past session. Thank you. Turn it back to the governor. I'm going to ask all, all of the uh, students here uh, to come go on downstairs. Uh, I'm going to come down shortly after the, the press gets to hammer me a bit. <laughs> and it's such a bloody spectacle that I don't want you to witness it. Uh, try. So why don't you go downstairs and where there's some fresh air and the like, if you just follow Laura there, and I'll join you shortly. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks so much. Thanks. I can, I can relate to passing out in front of an audience. <laughs> Mine was on statewide television, so uh, but, uh, anyway, I hope, I believe they're both okay. Yeah. So we'll uh, respond to questions on this particular subject and then move on to others. Freezing the, the taxes is terrible tax policy, it's terrible public policy. It's uh, you know, we're gonna reverse the, some of the real progress that others have mentioned that we made in terms of reducing uh, young people starting smoking and in terms of encouraging people who are smoking to, to quit. So it's, it's, it's terrible for Minnesota and it's just uh, very destructive to our fiscal stability in the, in the future. Why, why would they do this? Who benefits from this? Yeah, and what motivated them to make this one of their top priorities throughout the, the, the legislative session? Uh, those are questions to ask them. Governor, do you regret signing the tax bill now that it's been a couple of weeks? Do you wish you would have taken it down over things like this? No, because <laughs> we've been through this. Uh, you know, I, that would have uh, meant that our Commissioner of Revenue would be, and her whole, what, 1,300 employees would be, you know, uh, uh, unfunded as of July 1st. I mean, the legislature very intentionally set it up that I had no reasonable choice other than to sign the tax bill. Or, and so uh, they succeeded in that part. You mentioned this was in the bill throughout the entire session. You all had significant negotiations with the legislature. How often did this come up? How insistent were they? And why was it in the final bill if this was so important? Well, because it was important to them. I, I mean, Commissioner Bauer really could detail. She spent hours and hours with them on all the tax provisions, and we expressed very uh, clearly, directly, our objection to this and desire to have it removed. But they write the bill, and they control ultimately what's in it and not in it, and uh, they, they were insistent on this. It was a very, very important provision for them. And again, uh, I've heard Second-hand, third-hand reports as to why, so I'm not going to repeat uh, unfounded rumors, but there was obviously very, very strong incentive on their part to keep this in regardless. Governor, you agreed on this at some point in negotiations. Was it in the back of your mind that you might have, a, have an out, like the line item veto is to bring this issue back to the table? Did that coalesce in your mind yet, yeah, that idea? It had not coalesced in my mind at that point. No, no, no. Didn't call us until after I saw what you know they did with the Department of Revenue and some of the other antics. You say they're came in to big tobacco. They claim on the inflator issue anyway that it's principle. They don't like any tax to be you know just indexed to inflation. The cigar thing might be a different deal. But do you look at them uh, differently? Their rationale for these two? Well, I think their rationale is very different. I mean, you know, having a, a tax increase with inflation is. Is common. It's not absolute, but you know, as I said, the indexing of the uh, brackets, tax brackets themselves. I mean, it, what, uh, you could, I don't want to put Commissioner Baller on the spot, but you know, there are numerous other tax provisions. You will need to be on the spot. 
Good morning, Cynthia Bowerly, Department of Revenue. As the governor said, um, adjusting our taxes for uh, real-time dollars and, and adjusting over time is not unique to the t uh, cigarette inflator issue. Um, as the governor said, income tax brackets change over time. Um, other uh, credits, for example, uh, the thresholds for the income level at which you can claim those change over time. Uh, including things like the child dependent care credit. And of course, the purpose of that is to make sure that our tax uh, system is keeping uh, is keeping up with sort of the real value of dollar. And that's why this is uh, tobacco uh, change is so important because without that indexing in there, over time, the price of cigarettes stays flat, and that, of course, as our buying power increases over a decade, uh, they become more more affordable for kids and for others who are smoking. Was there any discussion during the session about getting rid of those other inflators? Or Not to my knowledge. Commissioner, as long as we have you up there, one of Republicans' main arguments on this is this, the tobacco tax is one of the most regressive, you're right against the folks that, that, the, that the governor says he wants to help. How do you respond to that? Um, we would be happy to continue the talk about how progressive our state's income tax has uh, become over under the governor's leadership, including with the addition of the fourth tier. Uh, as you might also, as, as you're talking with members about uh, regressivity and progressivity, um, the estate tax is one of the things that will make our system more regressive as a single item than any other item. And so while, of course, uh, we are always uh, concerned about making sure that we are moving our tax system towards a progressive state. Um, as we've discussed here today, there are other significant benefits to making sure that tobacco prices uh, stay in a place where they reduce the incentive for smoking. So um, I think that's a, that is a trade-off here. And certainly, um, you know, the governor has expressed concern about regressivity and has made significant strides to make sure he's been a leader on making our system more progressive. You know, any questions of the stars of the show here? I would like to respond to that regressive as you know that the tax issue there are other issues related particularly I love the fact that when the governor advanced the tobacco tax he led with health back in 2013 because this is a health issue and tobacco use is a regressive actually a, a regressive addiction it really impacts low income and low education folks and populations of color as Trey identified that these the, t the tobacco industry is purposely targeting lower income populations for addiction. And it really, if we can, and, and I don't know of anybody in that community who generally says we want to have more and more people addicted. So they really get support from low income populations, populations of colored American Indians who see this as a way of actually putting more money into their pockets and improving their health long term. Trey, you've been experiencing this since you were 11 years old? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's really, you want to tell people what you've been doing? Uh, um, well, uh, I think this might be my second time speaking uh, down at the Capitol. Um, I think uh, in the past I spoke in front of the Senate um, about the tax, about the tax, and uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm not really good on the spot, y'all. Um, yeah, yeah, I've been uh, doing this since, like I said, uh, like Governor said, uh, since I was 11. And uh, I think the first time I went in front of uh, people to testify was at uh, City Hall for the council members. Very good. Thank you. Megan, I wonder if we could have Megan up for a minute. I'm an iron joker, so I hope you'll still take a question from me. Oh, that's totally fine. <laughs> I remember way back, you know, when, when I was in school and high school and the pressure to be cool and all those kinds of things. I mean, does. Making these cigarettes, you know, kids are working and, and doing all these kinds of things now. Now, so they got money coming in. I mean, does raising the cigarette tax a little bit every year does it really cut this off uh, or not? Uh, yes, it really does because I know that like most of my friends, they do have jobs, but it's minimum wage, and they use that money. They want to buy food. They want to buy like cool stuff. But um, they also do want to buy tobacco products. And since the tobacco industry is targeting youth so much, that that's what they end up eventually doing because everybody else is doing it. It's a whole pressure kind of thing. So um, I think that by raising the taxes and by keeping the taxes high, and that way like people won't be as focused on trying to buy tobacco products because less and less people will be doing it because it's so expensive. So... I'll be down here and I'll let you go downstairs and go to the lobby down just a minute. Thank you very much. You guys are great. Thank you. Okay.
Any, anybody who's anyone who's uh, here with them is welcome to join us downstairs until the air runs out in that room too. But uh, <laughs> come on down. Well, I mean, people who don't want to pay any taxes for whatever reason and are willing to do something illegal to avoid it. I mean, I, I suppose the differential is, has a you know very margin, marginal effect, but people who are. Uh, engaged in illegal activity so they can, you know, pay no taxes are always going to object to, you know, a tax uh, at any level, the previous level or currently. So I, I don't, I don't subscribe to that, that view that it's uh, driving people to do something illegal that they wouldn't be doing otherwise. You raised the idea that the Department of Revenue would be potential collateral damage if you had vetoed the bill. But doesn't the same apply to your veto of the legislature? Aren't there a lot of employees over there who whose jobs and paychecks are at risk with this funding and Well, I, I regret the effect on the staff uh, very, very much. I mean, I went, I went through uh, watching thousands of, of very dedicated state employees, you know, up against the brink of the shutdown and then the actual shutdown in, in 2011. And uh, I, 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 you know, it's within the power of the legislative leaders, their leaders, to uh, remedy that in, in short order by coming back and doing the, the right thing in terms of the state of Minnesota and also the right thing in terms of the, their employees. Have you had any conversations with legislative leaders that indicate that they're willing to come back to the table? Well, coming, coming back, are we set for Tuesday at 9? Is that no? We're trying to get six different schedules uh, synchronized, So, but we're, we're in conversation with them about uh, or their staffs about the, the meeting for next week. you that they're proceeding still with their preparations for a lawsuit? I, I'm not going to comment. I, I, I only know what I see in the media here, read. I'm sorry? Have you been served papers? No. Who would represent you in that legal matter should it come to pass? And who gave you legal advice before you did your line item veto that's now being called on? Well, my general counsel gave me a legal advice uh, before the action. We've had preliminary conversations, but again, we not a lawsuit has not been filed, and, and uh, I'm much more focused. And I've been, uh, as you know, traveling around the state, and I will continue uh, next week to travel to focus uh, public attention on the reasons for the action I took, and this being one of them. Right. Preliminary conversations on who would represent you? Yeah, very preliminary, yes. Have been with the AG's office, or I'm have not you looked at that? Further. We don't have a lawsuit now. We're not preparing for a lawsuit in any formal way, and you know, we'll see. You said in Rochester, I'm going to carry the day. You're confident of your legal position on this. Are you concerned, however, if you did prevail, the precedent that would set for future governors, whether they be Republican, Democrat, or Independent, and their ability when they don't like something the legislature has done to get line item them out of existence or nearly out of existence? Well, uh, you know, there should be a balance. The legislature, you know, appropriates money or withholds money from executive branch agencies. So I, this, this separation of powers, I totally respect separation of powers, but, you know, we all, we, we all have just the powers that the Constitution assigns to us. And, and the Constitution assigned this power of a line item veto to me. It assigned to the legislature the authority to set budgets, to cut off budgets, uh, not to fund agencies, as, uh, as they've also done, done to the courts. So, I mean, to me, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, an even playing field. It's not even because the Constitution and the subsequent law puts different, gives different prerogatives to different entities. But to me, it's all consistent with what the Minnesota Constitution has established and the laws that have followed it. And if somebody wants to create a different uh, environment, they, you know, they can, the legislature can, can act uh, accordingly. But is it a dangerous precedent, do you think? I don't think so. Even though other governors could do this, it could become routine practice? I, you know, I, I, I can't predict the future. I just know that in this instance, uh, it's something I take very seriously. It's a very serious action, but the consequences for Minnesota's fiscal stability over the next decade and beyond are extremely serious, and we've seen what happened the previous decade, when uh, the state did not have the fiscal uh, stability necessary to, to weather a recession, and 
I, I mean, the consequences of that were horrific, including for many thousands of state employees who were involuntarily laid off in 2011. So, I mean, I've, I've lived through this. I know what this is like. I know how horrific. That's one of the reasons that I signed, uh, agreed to and signed the budget bills, because I, I, re I realized that otherwise everybody, everybody in state government would be put at risk. All the services would be at risk. The constituents, as I've said before, the DNR would have had to uh, rescind to cancel the uh, campground and park uh, reservations and not take new ones. I mean, this would have, once again, have affected very destructively a lot of Minnesotans' lives. So, so I signed those bills to protect the services that Minnesota state government provides. And, you know, again, they have an opportunity to remedy this and, and could do so next week, and we'd be resolved to this. Disputes in negotiations, not after the budget bills have been passed, and particularly not after you've signed those budget bills into law. Well, you know, each legislature is different. I can't predict what the future will be. I mean, you know, legislative leaders who have the power to write bills and know that budget bills have to be signed, or the or the agencies and the services are uh, struck down. Uh, take advantage of that and, and insert a lot of policy measures into these bills that have no no reason to be there, and you know arguably violate the single subject law uh, provision in the Constitution. But that's that's a, somebody else's court case for another for another day. But you know I think they've taken ex extreme advantage of that reality, and uh, you know that, that's that, that will see something that future legislators. Legislatures will should properly take into account. Senator Marty is contemplating a lawsuit. He's contemplating a lawsuit on single subject grounds. Um, some people are saying that's a quick side. John Marty requests another one. Other, some scholars though think that if that goes forward in combination with the GOP lawsuit, that the courts might actually tackle the single subject once and for all. My question to you is: Do you have hopes that the, the courts will settle that issue? You know, I I haven't. Uh, I know I, I know there was previous. Uh, at least, I know, cursory, cursory way, there's a previous lawsuit on that subject. I haven't followed that in any detail. I'm, I'm not qualified to comment. I don't know what. But just to the general question, do you hope the court will tackle that issue? Well, I, I can't say because, again, I don't know what the lawsuit is. Uh, it hasn't been filed. I don't, I don't know what the. Um, I mean, I, I think it's as a matter of policy, not judiciary, but as a matter of, of policy and, and, you know, Public integrity. I think that the legislature ought to look at it, but you know, legislature is not good at self-policing, so it may it may require somebody else to take a look at it. Mr. along the same line of what my colleague was asking, uh, do you think that the single subject dispute may give you some leverage from a legal sense as this proceeds down to possibly back some of these policy provisions out of the bill if you don't prevail? And, and, and you know, you guys are all just focused on the uh, the, the legal technicalities and the chess game it involves. I'm not engaged in that right now at all. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I haven't had substantive discussions with any lawyer about this except my general counsel. You know, I, I'm not qualified to get, say this, that, or the other. I, I'd like to see this resolved uh, through negotiations. That's why we're working to set up the media. I want uh, them to f explain to, to, to Minnesotans why uh, you know eliminating a billion dollars in tax revenue for the state is, is healthy for the state of Minnesota? Why freezing tobacco taxes is healthy for the state of Minnesota? Why freezing the CI, and, uh, which is a big driving force in uh, of the five billion total, is a bill over a billion. I mean, why are these policies good for Minnesota? And that's you know where I think uh, the focus ought to be. Last week, you laid out five conditions that you want attached to discussion of calling the legislature back. Are, those, are you firm in those five, or is there flexibility? Are you I, to I'm not going to start negotiating here with with myself. I, I, you know, we'll, we'll see what we'll see what unfolds. But you know, there are five five uh, re requirements. So we'll start with that. Thank you. Just real quickly on another topic. Any concern that no changes were made to the stadium authority? Is it true that your administration stood in the way and threatened to veto? No, the that is not true, and that is a scurrilous lie. And whoever's spreading that is is spreading a falsehood. That that bill collapsed because the 
House author was so intransigent that the Senate author decided not to proceed with the bill. We had nothing to do with that. We provided factual information throughout. Uh, Commissioner Franz testified that uh, it, the, some of the consequences in that bill, it's very poor, the House version very poorly thought through. It would really uh, affect the uh, authority's finances. It was, uh, I, I don't know what the justification for it was, but we did not in any way stand in the way. We watched it. It re reached the point where it could go to the conference committee. It, it didn't. That's a legislative prerogative. They had a lot of issues they're dealing with. We did not in any way interfere with that or attempt to stop that or block it. We were prepared for it to go ahead. We were prepared to go into the conference committee, as uh, Commissioner Franz did once uh, initially, to uh, try to make it a workable bill. And uh, you know, it's just, just uh, really disturbing that, that somebody's promulgating that, that, uh, that lie. It's a lie that we've tried to block it or stop it. It's just not true. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.